Hi folks, I'm absolutely delighted that the second edition of the Jaipur Lit Fest Toronto is returning to Canada in its new virtual avatar this month. Canada has a long-standing association with the Jaipur Literature Festival where several eminent Canadian authors have participated in previous years. For example, Margaret Atwood, Jan Martel, and many others. Last year, we partnered with Teamwork Arts to launch the first edition of the Toronto Jaipur Lit Fest. We believe that the benefits that the arts bring to the economy, to building identity, pride, and a shared sense of values are absolutely indispensable. Jaipur Lit Fest provides an exceptional platform for global authors and thought leaders to engage with each other and strengthen our cultural, bilateral, as well as people-to-people -people ties. And I can't think of a better city in Canada than Toronto for this to come to fruition. I extend my best wishes to Teamwork Arts, and the Jaipur Lit Fest Toronto organizers for another successful festival, this time virtual, and I look forward to seeing you all there online. All the best for a great festival. Thank you so much, Excellency Nadir Patel, for your kind words. And of course, thank you to all your colleagues at the Canadian High Commission in New Delhi as well as all, our, all the colleagues that we have out in uh, Ottawa and Toronto, the High Commissioner and the Consul General. A very warm welcome to the first session of the day to JLF uh, Toronto 2020 on behalf of Namida Gokhale, William Delrymple, all my colleagues at Team Buck Arts and JLF Toronto welcome you today. Our first session is Tyrant Stephen Greenblatt in conversation with Victoria de Grazia. Cherished institutions seem fragile, political classes are in disarray, economic misery fuels populist anger, people knowingly accept being lied to, partisan rancor dominates, spectacular indecency rules. These aspects of a society in crisis fascinated Shakespeare and shaped of his most memorable plays. With uncanny insight, he's shown a spotlight on the infantile psychology and unquenchable narcissist appetites of demagogues and the cynicism and opportunism of the various enablers and hangers-on who surround them and imagine how they might be stopped. As world-renowned Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt of Harvard shows, Shakespeare's works in this as in so many other ways remains vitally relevant today. Greenblatt will be in conversation with historian and author Victoria de Grazia. De Grazia's latest book is The Perfect Fascist. Stephen Greenblatt is an American literary critic, theorist, scholar, and Pulitzer Prize winning author. He's also the author of four books, including Tyrant, Shakespeare and Politics, and Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. He's Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University. Victoria de Grazia is a historian and professor at Columbia University. She's the author most recently of The Perfect Fascist, a story of love, morality, and power in Mussolini's Italy. Her previous books include Irresistible Empire, How Fascism Ruled Women, Italy, 1920 to 1945, The Sex of Things, and has a forthcoming soft power internationalism, 1990 to 2020. She was a founding member of the Radical History Collective. Please do remember that this conversation will be followed by a question and answer session. So 
please do feel free to comment and send in your questions by typing it into the comment section below and we will pose them of our speakers at the end of the session. The JLF, please stay tuned to the jlflitfest.org backslash Toronto for the full schedule and information about our speakers over the weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyrant, Stephen Greenblatt in conversation with Victoria de Grazia. Victoria, over to you and welcome to JLF Toronto 2020. Thank you so much, organizers, and thank you, public, wherever you are. Uh, both Stephen and I are interested in modern tyranny, the will to unfettered power, to seize power illegitimately, to rule by terror, tyrant from the ancient Greek, Tyrannus, the monarch, as it moved into Latin, later into English, its meaning became a, akin to and overlapping with other words, which you might be even more familiar with, imparting similar sense of arbitrariness, corrupt use of power, despot, autocrat, and today, dictator, strongman, fascist. These terms get mixed together, and in some way, we are going to be developing and thinking about uh, that, what that means, what that term means, what a tyrant is, what he does or she, the collaboration, and so on and so forth. So I write about fascism. I've, I've experienced it uh, by, through my work by living in Italy, and very recently, but maybe it's even 10 years, a longer time, I really want to drive a state through the heart of a fascist. It's kind of psychological as well as political need. Through the heart of the strong man, the despot, by getting behind the scenes, by doing what I do well, which is to dig, 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 dig through archives, to try to create a social history of a man, uh, get under his skin, through his family and his relations. And I had the opportunity to do that in this recent book called The Perfect Fascist, which is about one of Mussolini's close comrades from 1920 to the very end, 1945. So it becomes a study of this soldier, like a medieval condottiere, like figures who Stephen will be talking about and it talks about in his extraordinary book, The Tyrant. Okay. Uh, and I want to explore then the times of Mussolini, Italy under fascist rule. It focuses then on this fat rising fascist, his marriage to a very ambitious New York Jewish opera singer, his, which becomes very messy. He betrays her, she betrays him. It's alleged so. It was a very, very operatic, very much referring to some of the plays of Shakespeare as they are interpreted by Verdi through the operatic form. And what I was trying to understand is what this story of this man, his messy marriage, his messy personal life, his conflicts of loyalty over Mus between Mussolini and his family and the king and the army, all of these conflicting loyalties, what it tells us about how a quite ordinary man tried to become the perfect fascist, perfect in the sense of being loyal, perfect in the sense of being well uniformed always, perfect in doing his duty, even though he was a very mediocre person, even perhaps more because he was such a mediocre man and always trying to toe, toe the line. Now, Stephen, and we're going to work much more with his work book, is trying to understand what the tyrant is in a, a new work uh, of his, very new. It's, it's a departure from his previous work. It's, a, it's an act of resistance. He's trying to understand Shakespeare and his historical plays set against the tumultuous background of Elizabethan times and uh, what uh, he says, Shakespeare, about tyranny and tyrants. So the first question we want to get clear is what tyranny looks like in Shakespeare's time through Shakespeare's plays. Uh, what gave rise to it? Why is it so hard to see tyranny when you face it? Why is it so hard to resist? What was the worst that could happen? Okay. Uh, and Steve now will be talking about that. But first, as you get to that, I also want to talk, ask you about 
your motivation. I mean, in other words, this book came out, uh, you started to write it in 2016 and you're kind and, sh and but also shy and yet there's a powerful reason for you to, to devote yourself so fully to having written this work. Well, thank you, uh, Victoria. I'm so happy to be in conversation with you about this, uh, in, in part because your most recent book, The Perfect Fascist, was fascinating to me in, uh, you say you wanted to drive a stake through uh, The Perfect Fascist, but in some ways what happens is that you get drawn into the character who is not, after all, represented in your book as uh, uh, unequivocally uh, simply evil, but a rather complicated, ordinary person who gets more and more up in this and whose character, whose arrogance, narcissism, misogyny, and so forth and so on, is all caught up in months in the politics. I think the reason that my other things that are interesting is that Shakespeare opera, like how should we say, an ideological story, he, he's actually fascinated by characters, by how it is that certain people uh, become involved in uh, a nightmare of the kind that he depicts in uh, both in his histories and his tragedies. Uh, in terms of my own engagement, I'll, uh, I will take it your answer. I think I'll answer you from the moment, not simply from the moment in which I wrote uh, Set the Right Tyrant uh, four years ago, five years ago. I feel that we have all of us a kind of crisis of the civic imagination. Uh, and I speak of my crisis, my civic imagination, because it is extremely difficult for me fully to get mine into. Uh, those who want a certain kind of rule, who actually embrace, as if from my perspective, a very large number of my uh, fellow citizens uh, in, wanted four more years of what seemed to me uh, a nightmare. Uh, so I recognize that my account is to some extent a caricature of, uh, I can pick out certain grotesques, but it's not just grotesques, it's obviously people, and the opposite is also true, that uh, 70 or 75 million Americans have a great dif difficulty understanding my, own, my politics. So we look at each other from extreme opposite uh, points of view, uh, and I try to understand how millions of my fellow citizens most of them presumably decent people, concerned with the welfare of their families, their communities, their country, decide to do something that I regard as, uh, as catastrophic. So starting there, Shakespeare's plays are just to reflect on how the imagination works in political life. And in particular, how large people, how crowds, under the spell of certain kinds of fantasies, certain kinds of dreams, uh, yes, in the hands often of unscrupulous and cynical leaders, are induced to unleash their desires, unleash their fantasies. Uh, so that's where I start. I became fascinated by Shakespeare's account of how it happens that a complex, apparently healthy society with the ordinary motives of self-protection and self-interest fall into the hands of catastrophic leaders. Are we frozen, by the way, or can, can we hear? Uh, Stephen, we can hear you, and uh, now you ha just have an image of you, but it's a very nice image. So, <laughs> in, 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 and in compensation, your voice is moving much more fluidly. There was a bit of, of, of halting. I'm in, rural, I'm in rural Vermont, as I said, and our internet is not entirely reliable, so I apologize. We're, we're, it's it's clear. It's clear, but it, in some sense, you're it's 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 a double face that you're speaking about. You're speaking about one that the, the, this the nature of in Shakespeare of the uh, of of the tyrant, and then there's a question of the nature of this 
public that for reasons different from the goals of the, uh, uh, of the tyrant become enthralled. And I, I wondered if you, if you wanted to reflect on that uh, some, some more, um, that, that distinction you make in the, in the book, which in some ways is two different terrible puzzles. In other words, one is this, you know, the creation of the Richard III, uh, uh, the, 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 these figures. And then the other one is why, why uh, does the public respond? What is the public responding to? The courtiers, the figures around. And what sort of, so, so there seems to be two different kinds of, interest that you have in, in probing the tyrant, Shakespeare on power. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a relationship that you're very interested in. I think that it's probably the case, and of course you can uh, speak to this as well, Victoria, that in any large society there are uh, always a certain number of people, and we might as well say a certain number of men, it's a certain, uh, there are certain features that are distinctly male, uh, that uh, we could identify, how shall we say, with the uh, uh, certain kind of aggressive, uh, arrogant, uh, uh, domineering, uh, often intensely misogynistic character. I mean, these are people, as Shakespeare understood them, that exist in any society. The question is, how do they achieve power over large numbers of people? Well, sometimes they're born into it, but Shakespeare didn't think being born into it was enough because there are always competing forces. So Shakespeare becomes, we can come back to the personality, the particular personality of the tyrant and why, how Shakespeare thought such a personality gets formed. Often he thought in some relation to mothering, curiously enough, to how someone was mothered. Uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, Shakespeare is fascinated by the role of what I call enablers in my mm -hmm. book, those people who, uh, for one reason or another, and that the question is, what are the reasons, uh, support uh, or uh, sustain or allow such a person to rise to power. So uh, there are a number of different motives uh, for enabling uh, those collaborators or courtiers or henchmen. Mm -hmm. And the question is what Shakespeare mm -hmm. asked himself, as you've asked yourself in The Perfect Tyrant, what motivates such people and what uh, what leads them to enable, uh, in the case of Toruzzi, uh, your character, to, to help to enable Mussolini to do what he does. Uh, so in Shakespeare's account, there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, range uh, of enabling. There are some people who are genuinely fooled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Shakespeare thought on the whole, those were very small and insignificant numbers. Small children, a handful mm -hmm. of extremely naive and powerless people. Uh, who didn't really see that something catastrophic or terrifying was happening, but just get deceived by the lies. But Shakespeare thought that was actually a very, very modest number. It didn't account for what happened. He thought there were also a group of people who were frightened and impotent in the face of bullying and threats. Uh, those people who simply shrink when, they're, when someone shouts at them. But again, he thought that wasn't enough. Of course, Shakespeare doesn't uh, analyze these as abstract categories. He gives these names of characters, but you can step back a second from his place and see how it works. Then he thought that there were people a little bit like these who don't think much about anything, but simply do what they're told to do. There are always lots of people like that. But then he thought more interestingly in a way that there are people who cannot seem to keep in focus that the leader really is as bad as he is, uh, as he seems, as if it were hard work to remember uh, that, uh, that you were in the hands of someone whom you shouldn't allow this level of power to. There's a strong urge, in other words, among those people to normalize what isn't normal. And we've seen this, um, I'm afraid, in our own society and actually in the world at large, very, very often where you were, very strange people are coming to power mm -hmm. and there's an urge to say, well, the normal is going to hold. Uh, mm -hmm. It finally is just a variation on what ordinarily goes on. So that's another large group of people. And then 
each of these get Shakespeare gets more and more interested in the different types of people. There are those who don't normalize what's not normal, who don't forget, but they trust that everything in the long run will right itself, uh, that the norms ultimately will hold. They rely, in other words, on a structure that proves, in fact, unexpectedly fragile. And here again, there's another large category, and it's one that we've living through at the moment. Uh, it seems at the moment in my country that the normal has actually managed to hold, but everything seemed much more fragile suddenly mm. than it had seemed when I was growing up. It, suddenly what looked like an absolute given wasn't a given any longer, but was, a, was open to question. And then we get into darker territory. We get into those who persuade themselves that they can take advantage of what is going on. They can take it, they see that someone who shouldn't be there is there, who is taking power, who is violating the norms, who is doing something frightening, but they think they can take advantage of this, that they can step one, they can stay one step ahead of the tide of evil and take and get some profit from it. Uh, and those people, in effect, make an alliance with the, those who also enjoy the cruel game. Mm -hmm. who, in Shakespeare's phrase, make love to the employment, who, would, who get excited, uh, sexually excited, uh, excited in different ways by the enterprise of cruelty, by the, uh, the violation of the norms, by the breaking. Breaking things is fun for at least some people, and the, by the breaking of what looked like it was unbreakable. And all of these working together, Shakespeare thought, managed to allow the tyrant, the despot, the autocrat, uh, the, the Duterte or Orban or Bolsonaro or King John on or uh, Erdogan or Bashir al-Assad, or Alexander Lukashenko, all of these people who our world is now full of, uh, allow these people to come to the fore, even though you would think that people would see this is not a good idea. This is a terrible idea. Nonetheless, working together, they make, at least for a period of time, uh, such a uh, cat catastrophe, the catastrophe represented by Hitler and Mussolini in your book, they make mm -hmm. it possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an, a, an equilibrium in destruction that uh, the, I think the tyrant then tries to control, that is the breaking of the norms in order to, to create his total power with the collaboration for, you know, first of this, un, this mass that you can't always see and then at the very close, and then what you're saying is a whole typology in the characters of the fallout of this, this, this extraordinary range, which then, you know, the, the question is, how does the tyrant act to control the fallout? Because in some ways his power is both increased hugely by the total, the creativity of the destruction, but then when there are no norms at all, the tyrant himself begins to uh, be undermined by the the, the 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 total destruction. So, what I saw in uh, this perfect fascist and how they're working is there's a constant creative and immense disorder, but then also to try and recreate an order which would allow then for the ship of state, let's say, to keep sailing. Now. You could say that 20th century dictatorship is a more complicated uh, structure. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to you know, do an injustice to say, ah, oh, it was all dark in those days. <laughs> and but you, you, do, you, do, you do speak about that, the, the structures of the state, the, the, that of parliament, that there are these residues of constraint. Uh, there are moral people too. So, you know, I'd like to, again, you have the typology of the, if you want, the range of the bad, but then there's a sort of alternate world, possibilities uh, of buffering. And that's, uh, 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 it's like the anti-fascist position, the anti-tyrant. So what do you see then working its way through in the way of characters that 
represent something beyond the uh, the, the, the anti tyrant, let's say. In, 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 well, what what in Shakespeare's account, uh, what produces a kind of break or tries to uh, produce a kind of break on the uh, growing disorder and catastrophe uh, is the what Shakespeare called service. Mm -hmm. Actually, in, in King mm -hmm. Lear, uh, it's represented in King Lear in a character like uh, the noble Kent, who's mm -hmm. loyal to uh, the king and tries to tell the king he's tries to stop the king from doing something that he thinks is correctly is disastrous. And still more in King Lear, it's figured by the nameless servant, we never learn his name, who comes mm -hmm. forward and attempts to stop his master, who's the yeah. ruler of the land, from torturing someone mm -hmm. who's accused of treason. He says, I've never done you better service than I'm doing you now to tell you stop. Yeah. And he's killed for his attempt to stop this going on. But it represents a kind of moral heroism that can't be completely, in Shakespeare's account, can't be completely extinguished. Yeah, it's a horrific Those are the moments that Shakespeare doubt. revels in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had a conversation, Victoria, uh, with um, a man named Egils Levitz, who's the president of the Republic of Latvia, and a very interesting, uh, very thoughtful man. Uh, and he said to me that democracy has among its goals and benefits the elimination or at least the reduction of those moments in which individuals have to show extraordinary moral courage. That the great thing about democracy is that there are very few moments in which you have to show extraordinary moral courage. All you have to do is to vote. And I think Shakespeare would have, uh, Shakespeare who celebrated moral courage uh, would have been amazed by a system uh, that in which a basically ordinary person could simply vote rather than put his life on the line to stop a moral outrage. But Shakespeare is fascinated by those moments in which a at least relatively small number of people in the face of chaos, disorder, or all of the forces that are unleashed by an autocrat, nationalist fervor, militarism, voodoo economics, the attacks on education, violations of the basic norms, everything that's represented in Shakespeare when Shakespeare's demagogue says, kill all the lawyers. The first, the first thing we do, we'll do, let's kill all the lawyers. The line that always gets a laugh in Shakespeare, in, when, when that play is performed in Shakespeare. But that's a kind of dream of just breaking all of the laws. Uh, and there are, in Shakespeare thinks that there are always a certain number of people who say, hold on, but often they do so at the cost of their lives. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare doesn't have a very optimistic account of how the system is stopped. It's stopped at the cost of enormous suffering uh, and many, many lives. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's fascinating that there's no notion of Antifa or the anti as a, as a, as a movement, uh, you know, of, of, of a popular democracy, uh, which gives so, such a much more a sense of the absolutism of, of tyranny. Uh, that's, a, that's a, an extraordinary difference, if you want, between the 20th century account of fascism and the, 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 what, what comes out in, in the historical plays of Shakespeare. Another sort of question that comes up very vividly in Tyrant, and which I found in my work, is the position of women. As a feminist, we, I used to think, or I even did work, to say women were outside. If I subscribe to the idea that they're not present. Uh, they're pushed back. They're out of the public. Or if they're in the public, it's in a very organized, organized, enthusiastic way. But it, that's which isn't in some ways spontaneous. This work, I found women everywhere uh, in positions of complicity, following in some sense the range that, that you described of collaboration. And that seemed to surprise you as well, or <laughs> surprise in the sense caused that kind of wonder, which made you comment uh, and uh, on it. Uh, and this is not just 
Lady Macbeth, but but also Lady Macbeth. So I was you know, your your thoughts on Shakespeare's thoughts about about the the women, the women gendered as women, or you know, gendered in very peculiar ways who who support or yeah. in some cases undermine, but I mean, Shakespeare has a very uh, complicated range of, of reflections, I think, on this issue, Victoria. One has to do with, um, as I've already mentioned briefly, with the extent to which Shakespeare thought something about the character of these, this kind of male has to do with mothering. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And he has two rather different accounts of what the mothering, what the, the destructive mm -hmm. mothering, if that's what it is, would be. One is a mother who refuses or fails to love the child. That is in the case of Richard III, who is born with ugly and with teeth and uh, who has had a, she's had a difficult, she said she's had a difficult uh, pregnancy and she never, the mother, the Duchess of York, never really loves the child. And the, and the play is very much built around a kind of anger on the part of, the, of Richard uh, that clearly is related to uh, the mothering and also an attempt to get his voice into the head of the mother. So that's one version, Shakespeare's version. We can come back to that. And the other is an alternative or quasi-alternative, which is the terrifying mother in Coriolanus, mm. Columnia her name is, who basically tries to shape her little boy to be a kind of expression of the rage and aggression that as a woman in, her, in Roman society, she's not allowed herself to release so that the son acts out the, in Shakespeare's account, this is simply Shakespeare's idea, working with his materials of how this kind of character comes about. Uh, so on the other hand, when Shakespeare thinks about how this misogynistic creature the, the ty tyrannical male behaves in society, he has a different account of how women mm -hmm. are brought mm -hmm. into this. And it's halfway between seduction and rape. Mm -hmm. You can't tell in Richard III whether Lady Anne is actually being seduced or whether she's being raped. Mm -hmm. uh, she is in a vulnerable position, terrifying, mm -hmm. vulnerable position. On the other hand, it's not entirely that she's being uh, forced. She has some complicated kind of complicity or possible complicity mm -hmm. in this. And that Shakespeare is fascinated by that mm -hmm. mix of vulnerability mm -hmm. and rape. And I think, Victoria, mm -hmm. that it's not simply a gendered issue or purely a gendered issue. I think Shakespeare thinks that's the situation that the audience is in, in relation to a very mm -hmm. powerful rhetorically, as he, Shakespeare mm -hmm. himself was, rhetorically overwhelming figure, he thinks the audience is half seduced, half raped uh, by the performance. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that it's part of Shakespeare's fascination with how mass culture works, because mass culture works by placing everyone in the situation of the, uh, of placing the mass of people in the situation uh, that women in an oppressive society are put in, where they're simultaneously, uh, they're, they're beleaguered and seduced at the same time. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, Mussolini always would speak of the, the crowd is female, um, the, the, you know, the, the masses are supine, uh, the rape and complicity and then this sort of orgiastic enthusiasm, a continuum, because yes. the, the, the difference of power is so enormous. But even with respect to his own men, there's a creation. I could see this in his commander of the black troops, 350,000 men, this Cheruzzi, and was, he was often having to play the female element because of this enormous power, even to the point mother, you know, the, the, the overpowering mother, cut his beard off, tell him to cut his beard off. He shouldn't be looking, going, running around looking scraggly or, you know, just the sign of his sexuality, that the, the big beard with which he would then convert after hours in his uniform. So there's a huge attention in these 
Latin fascists particularly, to their virility and how it can be translated into power to overwhelm in this yes. spectacular power. And of course, that is, you mentioned Lady Macbeth, but that is the situation Shakespeare imagines in Macbeth, whereas on the one hand, Macbeth is the most perfect uh, figure of, of machismo, uh, who will, uh, of overwhelming martial power. Uh, he's depicted at the beginning of the play as cutting someone down from his nave to his chops. Uh, and then on the other hand, you get... Macbeth is manipulated by his wife, threatened with a kind of impotence constantly. Then you were a man when you did that. You're not really being a man. So the the flip side of the machismo is a tremendous anxiety that you're not fully a man, that you're actually, uh, you've suddenly taken the woman's role in this, uh, in this extremely unequal, sexually unequal world. But both things are at play at the same uh, moment. Everyone is in these plays, in that sense, sexualized. That was Shakespeare's discovery. Yeah, yeah. In fascism, we saw you know, this excess of sexuality. You know, sort of the word love is bandied about constantly. And Mussolini, in particularly, who has the idea of a classic tyrant in his head, coming from Machiavelli, being uh, the, the tyrant is half beast, half man, and therefore he has got super instincts, super sexuality. He has a right to a harem, a well-ordered harem. And he used the word harem as, you know, as part of his sort of appanage uh, along uh, more than an inner circle. It was the, the harem which cocooned him. So it, it also acted like these other, you know, the male retinue, which you are always speaking of this retinue, this coterie, this band of brothers, which, is, is part is, is sort of partakes of the of the of the tyrant's lust uh, and and ambitions. So it's a sort of a, a sexualizing both of the uh, of the, the inner space and then progressively sort of spewing it out. So you know, it's, it's all passion and, and 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 emotion and sex, and that is an enormous stimulus both to the inner power, and certainly this is under fascism, and then to creating a kind of intensity that then becomes a vice for the whole society. Where, in other words, it seemed to be like as if your, your public leaving the theater is, is reacting also with, with an excess of intensity, as, as, as if they would leave with you know, their, their, their heads not settled. And that was always the impression one had when people left uh, listening to Mussolini uh, from in, you know, in the piazza, one of these incredible performances or you know, speaking from the balcony or from seeing him on film, this kind of confused emotion, which then seems to just cry out for more. <laughs> it doesn't seem to want to cry out, give us peace, give us, you know, stay away. Or there seems to be ambiguity in any case in how people respond uh, uh, to that. With some saying, "Just give us peace. Let's just stay home and not go to the you know, go, go to the the huge events, the huge performances," and others saying, "We'll have another one in a month," and and so on and so forth. Yes, I was thinking about about these mass uh, uh, performances. I mean, Shakespeare, of course, thought a lot about them. I mean, he was fascinated by them. It's what his, because they were so deeply related to, to his own enterprise. He brings two or 3,000 people in an afternoon into the small theater and he captivates them. He takes them to another world. He has them enter a kind of fantasy. I was thinking about them on the night before their, our election just now in the United States, when I saw the crowd, uh, most of them not wearing masks, at Donald Trump's midnight rally in Opelika, Florida, and the crowd started chanting, fire Fauci, fire Fauci, fire Fauci, again and again. I thought, what could they possibly be thinking of? What is going on in them? What conception of, electrical, of electoral politics could lead Donald Trump to encourage such chanting, uh, to welcome it? And I think the answer must lie in part precisely in the manipulation of the imagination, in the fantasy, in this case, that firing the doctor would cure the disease uh, or would make good on the claim that the disease was largely a doctor's plot to fill the coffers of the hospitals. But 
it's the invitation to enter the fantasy world. Come in with me. And for that moment in the kind of ecstatic chant, uh, or the equivalent of a kind of passionate applause, uh, enjoy this occasion. And that's why, in some ways, the strangest aspect of Shakespeare's, or the most remarkable aspect of Shakespeare's brooding about ty tyranny, is that he thought that the most plausible way for a tyrant to come to power would be to be elected. We would think because of Shakespeare writing as he did in the late 16th, early 17th century in a monarchical system, that he would think only of the kind of figure who comes to power by being born that way, or perhaps as the case of Macbeth by assassinating uh, the existing ruler as it would happen in Machiavelli. But Shakespeare thought, no, election. Mm, a, mm. An election must be the way in which this is likeliest to happen. Mm. That was a fascinating point. I mean, it, it's, it's almost en passant. And you think, my election, how is that possible? So, so it, it's an aggressive, addressing this problem, which, which you highlight this question of how he becomes legitimate, by what, what, what causes this, these figures to become legitimate and then to sustain their legitimacy. And yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hard question. I have a, one, it's, unfortunately time is, is, is short, but you, 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 there's no question you, you speak of the conscience of tyrants or Shakespeare does. How, how do they justify their deeds? And then I think, you know, do they have remorse? I mean, you know, in other words, we're looking for that we're, because it, it, it's a way in which we in the present or gosh knows it thinking in, in literature tries to understand better the character, whether they're Christians, whether they're humans, <laughs> or Christians in, 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 the, in the Western sense, you know, are they humans? Do they have remorse? Um, which is a kind of a way to say, ultimately they are like us. Uh, there is some kind of redemption uh, by the way they die, uh, by the recognition that of their flaws. I think that Shakespeare did imagine in a couple of his plays, the, the, did allow himself to, uh, to think through the idea of someone awakening from madness, as Leontes mm -hmm. in The Winter's Tale awakens from his madness. Uh, is broken, usually by something horrible happening, or King Lear come, in effect, awakens from madness. But I think, I'm sorry to say that on the whole, Shakespeare didn't think that one could wait for an attack of conscience or remorse. I think that Shakespeare's vision for, most persuasive vision, I think, for what goes on inside the tyrant when things begin to fall apart, it's just a feeling of overwhelming emptiness. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this mm -hmm. petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Mm -hmm. That sense that everything is just a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing that Macbeth expresses at the end. The sense that it's all been nothing. No moment of coming to terms, no real grappling with what the tyrant has actually brought, the dis disaster that he's brought on so many people, but just a feeling of emptiness, of being a loser uh, at the end. It's a ter we should write I mean, something about the end of tyrants in the, in the 20th century to think Mussolini and his German corporal's uniform trying to escape and no remorse. I mean, really saying, why didn't I rid myself of the king and the church and all the bourgeoisie earlier? In other words, going to join Hitler in the in the mountains for some last stand, make, hoping that they'll be able to pull out an atomic bomb or you know, the last words of Hitler telling people to fight on as he commits suicide. Do you think, and this is a terrible perhaps, point to, 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 to end on, we should... Well, we did speak about the moral political basis for de defying the tyranny, and we didn't see a lot of that in, in Shakespeare. But you know, histories of tyrants in the Shakespearean sense, but but not only, are often retold as tragedies. Uh, you know that they are their fatal flaws. Um, that there is a kind of morality uh, in 
in the way they finally will lose their power, except that you say, in fact, it's with an emptiness. So do you think that we could, somebody would write a Trump agonistes, <laughs> thinking back about Nixon agonistes, of course, that was written in 1970 before other things unfolded, that one could ever think of Trump, President Trump, as, as the subject of, of, a, of a tragedy. You know, T.S. Eliot uh, described the play of uh, Marlowe's as a tragic farce. And I think that tragic mm -hmm. farce is closer to what we might come up with in the end than a tragedy. Or if we want to invoke uh, a tragedy, I think, and I think this would be closer to Shakespeare's vision of things, it would be, how should we say, our tragedy, not mm -hmm. the tragedy of the character, the tragedy of of our collective life, the tragedy of our attempt at a democracy. And beyond that, because finally, what does this country's democracy or that country's democracy matter in the long run? The tragedy of our planet, mm -hmm. the tragedy of our collective life as creatures on this earth. I think that uh, Shakespeare's vision and Shakespeare's vision is often global and planetary that way, thinks about not only what this particular political life is like, but what does it mean for us as a species? And what does it mean for the natural world in which we uh, try to inhabit and which we're poisoning uh, at the moment? And I think that, that it's from that perspective that Shakespeare might, how should we say, imagine us getting from farce to tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the sense of denuding, denuding of our American specialness, that's which makes it in some ways hard to trust then this, as you started in the very beginning to say this, this new, this return to the normal, you know, is, it, is it real? And that denuding of hope, which certainly, you know, young people have to have and should have, but uh, yes, I have. I have my children and my grandchildren who can't retreat, who can't afford to retreat into a kind of uh, sour skepticism, uh, a shrugging of the shoulders, uh, cosi fan tutte uh, spirit about uh, the human project, but who need to think ahead to what we can do uh, as a community, as a country as a, uh, a species on the, on the earth uh, to ensure that we don't fall into the hands of these horrible people and that we actually focus on what we need to focus on, which was how to heal our relationship to our planet, how we need to heal ourselves. I think talk of the specialness of America, uh, from my perspective, misses the point. Uh, of each country has a special history. Each country has particular virtues and vices, but we're, we must figure out ways of being in it together collectively uh, to try to deal with what we're now facing as a planet. And the COVID crisis is a perfect emblem for that. The, 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 our administration's response, which was to turn it out into the individual states, was ridiculous. This is a collective act, not just for a country, but for the world. We need to fight. It's, it's as if a, a, a beings had come from another planet, and we need to, to destroy us, and we need to fight against it collectively. And it's not about individual, the, the bloated, grotesque ego of individual countries, and let alone individual leaders. It's about what we must do collectively as a species on this planet. You know, that I think is, is the great beauty of, of, of this work, Tyrant, is the sense of that we're left with a, a sense of the creativity about the collectivity. Unlike many of the recent works on fascism, which try to create a typology of the fascist, the fascist is anti this, the fascist is anti that, the fascist you know, does this, it does that. And in some ways, it leaves us with terror to hear that lineup and to see 
think that our figures are like that or are that. It, it, it's nihilistic in some ways, this, these typologies, whereas this study is humane uh, because Shakespeare is, because, because, because you are, but above all, because I, it, it's, a, it's a, a pamphlet, it's a, a libel, it's a, a, a work, this is a way of conclusion, uh, which does, in the end, operate against that hollowing out created by the, the tyrant, the historic tyrant, the literary tyrant, and calls forth sort of the filling with this, with this sense of everything's to be done. And we have the creativity uh, and the imagination to, to think beyond these figures. So this story, I think that's true. Right. I think it's deeply true of Shakespeare. I mean, that is to say, I think Shakespeare, toward the end of his life, tried to think not about tragic endings, but yeah. about uh, how to make it possible to work through tragedy to something hopeful at the end. Hopeful in a realistic way, hopeful in the, in the way, that, a tough-minded way of looking at how bad things can be, but not simply throwing up your hands, mm -hmm. uh, but, but figuring out how collectively uh, to move forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Such a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure's mine. We're open to questions now, aren't we, Sanjay? Oh, we've got a great numbers of questions. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Shall I read the questions or? Yes, Victoria, just go ahead and ask. Oh, yes, so Raven asked Stephen, is there any other figure in the world of literature who you believe holds the same significance or has written in a similar manner to Shakespeare and his way of looking at the world? I mean, in, I think in the period that I most study, uh, that I spend the most time on, I think that in their way, both Montaigne and Cervantes uh, have very comparable uh, feelings, a feeling of, of uh, impatience with the huge monstrous megalomaniac egos uh, of, the, of the great in the world, a feeling of, of uh, and a feeling ultimately uh, of what, how it would be possible to think your way out of that box. And I think, as they say, both Montaigne and, for me, both Montaigne and Cervantes are the great figures, maybe with Rabelais in, in France as well. Outside of my period, of course, there are innumerable, in some sense, innumerable people who have great writers who have thought, I think, profoundly about collective human communities and how they could save themselves uh, from, from the catastrophes represented by uh, by the tyrants in Shakespeare. And we can probably together collectively make up a long list uh, of such writers uh, that ex would extend all the way from, uh, from the ancient world, from Euripides, let's say, uh, all the way through to great contemporary writers. Victoria, Stephen, unfortunately, we're going to have to close the session because we've just completely run out of time. It was absolutely fascinating, especially when you, and, and frightening, especially when you talked about the manipulation of the imagination and the love that people feel of tyrants and feed off them. I mean, this is what we're seeing across the world. And I wonder when this will change, if at all, if Shakespeare's written about it so long ago and it still continues. Uh, through generation after generation, will the, the removing or the moving of Trump or the moving on of Trump change anything? Unlikely. But thank you both so much for this absolutely fascinating session. And I'm sorry we couldn't uh, ask you all of the questions that I think were posed of Victoria. Thank you all for being such a great audience. We've completely run out of time. Of course, we encourage you to buy the books of our speakers available through bookstores listed on the JLF Toronto website. Please have a look. And uh, once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support. Uh, we do hope you've enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session, Crossover Narratives, Anne Cleaves, Anush Irani, 
and Emma Donahue in conversation with Deviani Saltzman. This is at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, 7.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time and 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again. And now we present a reading by John Elizabeth Stinsey from the Jaipur Writers Short Series. Stay tuned. Don't go away. <laughs> My name is John Elizabeth Cincy, and I'm going to be reading to you from my poetry collection, June Bat. It came out from House of Nancy. This poem is called America and Putting My Queer Shoulder to the Wheel. The night America took off her mask, we slept together poorly. I'd woken up early that Tuesday, dragged myself to a gymnasium in Jersey City to cast my vote into the void. I came all the way out to Hampton Bays to see her. Her picking me up in that old Mercury van, her bringing us back to her place. As we watched the footage of the country reveal its frightening hue, we were shocked, but not. A few days later, I came back. My nails were painted blue the week after the mask fell from America's fist, the week when the victorious hatred began. I walked through a boken to work one morning where ten tiny splashes of color on my body might be enough to get me killed. I realized then I had a choice. Stay queerly small and queerly quiet, or become emboldened too. But like a true American Nazi, I could drop my mask and live life alive. In the months after, I dismantled the mask piece by piece while America lifted her skirt to let free her pale hounds. I dipped my head in cerulean dye and felt mortality pound through every vein. Felt myself climbing to the paper surface of me. I let my body fold and unfold. I let my body be loved by a woman I loved more than air could explain. I let myself be a foggy pile of indeterminate me and I learned to love myself like that too. Despite the fear of the mortal danger, I grew bold in a way the system hated. I decided that if this world was going to kill me, I'd die against the grain. I decided that if America confronted me with her rancid mouth screaming, I would stand as tall as her and scream back. My nails, bright and tiny nodes of resistance in the land of the craven, my hair, glowing like a backlit sapphire in a home of flame. I looked in the mirror and sang the words of a new loud anthem for this new vast me.